Um, it's ever since I moved up here, 2001. Uh, two, yeah, about 2001. And I always wondered, who's doing that? 75. And you've been doing it since 75. 1975. Okay, so I caught yeah. the, the latter end of it. <laughs> but like myself and many people that have seen your work and uh, are familiar with it, it's really exciting to put a, a face to the work. And we're really honored to have your work here. Um, Foundational. So, Foundation. Yeah, he was uh, in the Chronicle, and there was a little write-up about the artist talk. And he was referred to as a foundational artist <laughs> in the Emeryville, uh, with the right. kind of Emeryville mud flats. Uh, he can talk about that and what that is. He's basically the last artist kind of working out um, in the mud flats. And that's your primary like gallery. Your yes, last. that's my, been my gallery for all that time. Cool. So. so I'll dim the lights <laughs> so we can see the screen a little bit better and mm -hmm. let it rip. I really recommend the books for anybody. Um, somebody came to my studio. Uh, he used to be the Caltrans photographer out on the freeway. Mm -hmm. And he took a picture of me. He said, can I take a picture? Sure. Can I take a picture of your work? Sure. Can I do a book of your work? Oh my gosh. Um, once it's done and on the internet, it's $30. I can, I can buy 10, 20, one, whatever. My neighbors wanted one. They got on the internet. $30. They said they even sent it in the mail, at no extra charge. So this uh, outfit that does the book, and the nice thing about it, I can bring it to him. I left it here a week, and they said, yeah, they saw what they wanted in the book. Before, you had to do slides or bring your work in or whatever. But, um, well, and, you know, Tyler doesn't have a website and a big <laughs> web presence, but it doesn't matter. He's got a book. Push the little button. I'm glad to see you're using a slide projector. <laughs> <laughs> We're bringing it back. We're bringing it back. We're so not. Oh. Maybe you pushed it one button too little. No, the other way. What's that? Oh. Is it automatic? Mm -hmm. Do that. There you go. Oh, yeah. I went to school. It won't. It's glass. No, this is a, this is about as good as we get. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we tried. <laughs> I uh, started making sculpture when I was about 10, and I didn't know what, uh, what I wanted to do, but I went to Greenwich Village and lived there for a year and knew I wanted to be an artist, but I had no business being in New York City at 20 years old. So I went to the University of Kansas. I grew up in Joplin, Missouri, and I got my degree in drawing and painting. And then my wife is a nurse, and we went to Kansas City, and she got her degree. And I told her when I uh, asked her to marry me, I said, I'm going to California. Because I grew up on Route 66 in Joplin, Missouri, and you got to go to California. <laughs> and she said, OK, she'd go. And it's the minute she got her degree, and I had mine, we had it, we've been in Berkeley ever since. Mm -hmm. And I had made, um, I did drawing and painting was my degree, but I had made sculpture. And the faculty really didn't like, what, and I'll show you some later of what I did. And so when I had my senior show, I got four A's and four F's. Oh, and so they had a big discussion. They said, well, let's give him a C and get him out of here, which was fine with me. I thought that was great. So I was a painter, but I was making sculpture. And so I had done a couple of paintings about six foot by six foot of an airplane. The, the wing came out into the room, and the tail went out one way, and the propeller went out the other way. Well, so when we got to Berkeley, we had a nice apartment that had a big, big basement. And I would say it was 40 by 30. It had a fireplace, even. And so I had lots of room, and I made this airplane. So that would have been 19, when I was 25. We came to California when I was 25. Uh, it was pretty rough. It was about 8 by 10. But it was the idea of where I was headed. No, wrong way, I guess. So this is a little refined, painted a little better, nicer pilot, nice. This was in the John Bowles Gallery. Um, someone gave me a piece of paper. It was Robert McChesney, the guy who did Bones in his painting. He had a show in Berkeley at Candy Tabs Studio C. And um, after the show, he left this little note of paper for me. And it said, Madame LeBeau, Frederick Hobbs, and John Bowles. Okay, took that little piece of paper, and the first year I went to see Madame LeBeau. And she said, I don't like your work, but I'm going to give you your show. And so my friends from 
the Kansas, where happened to be visited, and we went to the opening. And he said, why are you showing this lady's living room? I said, go over in the corner there and read that thing. It was everybody who had shown there their very first show in San Francisco. It was everybody they'd ever heard of in their life had had his first show. That was her mean in life. That was what she was going to do in life, is give everybody their first show, even if she didn't like the work at all. So I waited a year, and I went to see Frederick Hobbs. He had his art center in San Francisco. And I went one day, uh, I'm telling you this for a reason. I went to see him. It was the middle of the afternoon. He had been drinking all day. He had three or four women worshiping him, as he sat in his throne. He looked at my work, and he insulted me. And, and so I got back in the car, and they said, it looks like somebody hit you in the face. And I said, oh, it was awful. It was terrible. But I thought about it. He'd been so right with that first one. I tried. So I went by one morning. He wasn't drunk yet. He was sober, still in his pajamas, saw the same exact work, and said, this is wonderful. I'll give you a one-man show. I'm going to call, remember Frankenstein, the great? Call Frankenstein. Oh, I've discovered this. Horse. So it depends on what time of day you go <laughs> <laughs> and if they're sober. So I stayed with him for a year, and we did have a group that we'd have shows together. So then uh, about the time he was ready to close it, the lady came from the John Bowles Gallery. And she saw that first image that you saw in my sculpture. And this was the kind of stuff I was doing on the wall. That was a figure like the ones out there. And so the plane was getting a little better now. And so the Richmond Art Center had a, a show called Flight or something. And this was in a glassed-in space out there. And I've added another wing, cleaned it up a little more. Well, I decided when we were bringing that one home from the Richmond Art Center, I didn't want it anymore in my studio. I didn't have room. And so we took it out in the bay and put it on that first post. And so we were going back to the Midwest to visit. And we got back. The newspapers loved it. It was United Press International, but it was gone. So I, I called the reporter and I said, I meant that to stay there forever. And so it was gone. So I started building. This, the Red Baron that everybody knows. As it was about half done, I built it in about a week or two, uh, they said, oh, your airplane's on the top of the Caldecott Tunnel. <laughs> but we want money. So I called a reporter, who nobody knew who I was, and he didn't either. I said, they want money. And he said, let me take care of it. And he did. An hour later, they called and said, come get it. And so <laughs> we started doing, putting the Red Baron out. Now, it takes a boat or two, a couple of ladders. It takes uh, four people and a truck. This, this was the, uh, a coffee pot or coffee urn. And hunters on the way to the woods will shoot at it. It has all kinds of holes in it from adjusting their sights. So this is the green one's back. We're starting out with the red one. And a week later, the green one's again, gone. And we assume it's in a, a fraternity basement up on the campus somewhere. Because they had to have two boats, a truck, and they did it at night. Mm -hmm. So we don't know where. That, so that one disappeared forever, the green one. So I kind of like the fact that there were two fighting each other. That's the Golden Gate Bridge. One thing that came up was what happens to them when they fall in the water. It's right in line with the Golden Gate Bridge. So it's the ocean. It's not bay calm water. It's ocean waves. So you wait for a wave to lift you up on the boat, and you hammer a nail, and then you go back down. You go out. <laughs> People always ask me, why don't you use one of those fancy drills or screw guns or something? No, you can't do that. You need a hammer and whatever. So that was a typical installation. It happened to be a canoe, which I don't remember, but a canoe and a boat with ladders going, connecting them made a platform. And I have to tell you, when we started out, it was a bunch of friends and neighbors, we left one guy on shore with a bunch of fake paperwork. This was the University of California. We had sold it to uh, uh, the city. <laughs> so <laughs> we had sold it to somebody. It wasn't ours. Anyhow, we had a wonderful time. It was just like ice. He had an awful time. He didn't know who was going to come get him, how much trouble he was going to be in. But we had a good time doing it. So for a week or two, that's what was there originally. And then the green one's gone again. There's 
trying to get it up, trying to get it nailed into place. But canoe in a boat is not bad. For, and that's the one people saw for 20 years. There's a, see, these rocks, the minute anything falls into the water, the waves just dash. I can go back the next day and I find the, uh, the head from the dragon and the whatever one day later. One week later, there's absolutely nothing. It's all gone. Just don't have to worry about that at all. Now, I do go down and get it once in a while and repaint, or I did repaint it occasionally. So there's a, just a new paint job, adding another wing. So that's... Is that at your house? Yeah. That's at my house, and that's the second. So that's maybe 10 years later. What's it covered with, Tyler? It looks, it almost looks like it's fabric. It is fabric. It's like they made World War I airplanes. They made a, a frame, and then they put bed sheets over it and gessoed it, and then it becomes quite solid. Now, the wings are just three-quarter inch plywood, but the body is hollow, and... Um, no, it's pretty well attached. It just starts to fall apart and whatever. And that I'm still using the coffee pot, coffee gun. Now this is another one built later. And the, the heart thing is what I put on the post, which you'll see later. Now this one, uh, the, the word got out that they were stealing them or whatever. And so Joe Scoma had a restaurant right on the bay. And he said, I'll pay to have lights put on it and we'll watch it and nobody will steal it. So this was one for Joe Scoma for out in front of his restaurant. There's the pilot. Everybody wants the pilots. They disappear pretty, pretty quick. <laughs> so this is installing that one out in front of Scoma's. This is probably the front of <coughs> Scoma's restaurant. And that's what it's like to get it up there and then nail it into place. The, I would say the posts are 18 foot tall. So at low tide, there's about six foot of water. At high tide, there's about 12 foot of water. So we try to go at high tide so we can reach up and do that. So that would have been in front of Scomas, and that's the other kind of thing I do on the other posts are sculptures like that, which are a lot, <laughs> lot easier, but uh, you still have to have the boats in the high tide. One of the planes, well, I put it in front of the city hall in Berkeley in a show of sculpture out front, and some lady thought it was a Nazi thing. It's World War I, not World War II, but she was all upset. She had attacked it with her cane, and she had her grandson come knock it over. So it was kind of beat up. So I took it home, and I decided to use what was still okay add another wing, add an um, engine. And I had been to the Soapbox Derby in San Francisco, the first one, which was 75, I think, but about the same time as I was doing this. And I had a three-wheel racer. I came down, did 30 miles an hour, and uh, no pedal, no anything, just coasting. And there were uh, about 50 artists work in the Soapbox Derby, and maybe 5,000 people. And it was so great to be have your work out in the public. So I said, OK, I started doing the airplanes. And I had done about five airplanes at this time. And I said, well, wouldn't it be fun to ride in it down the hill? So I was to sit here in the back pilot. And I could control the wheels for brakes. And I wanted the propeller to go around. And I live in the Berkeley Hills. And my neighbors had atomic energy. And they had, you wouldn't believe the designs they had for an engine. But I had an old lawnmower. So I turned the lawnmower sideways, attached the propeller to the lawnmower. Then I did the thing you do in your car to take out the oil filter so I could make it go fast or slow. And I could come down the hill with the propeller going, me and the pot. Well, it was such a great day, but I didn't realize it at the time. None of us did, that the soapbox derby was such a phenomenal time. But that was where this plane went down the hill. It ended up in the Albany High School in the entrance. My daughter was a student there, and I talked to the principal. He said, yeah, we'd love to have it. And they organized whatever to hang it. And so it's been hanging there for 25, 30 years. So it's in pretty good shape. And all the other artists from the Soapbox Derby either destroyed them or lost them or whatever. 
But there is a gallery in LA, a, a large art center, that wants to do a soapbox derby show in 2017. And they said they want to come get this. So it may, it may get a second life. I talked to the high school. They said, oh, that'd be fine. This was in my studio uh, for 20 years. This was all finished. I just kept, kept it in my studio. Uh, this is the one uh, we did one time. And I think this was it. We turned it a little. And everybody always says, it has to go with us on the freeway. So it has to be turned the other way. But that was an exception. But this was Lincoln Beachy. He's the guy, uh, when they had the big fair, he flew around in his monoplane and crashed or whatever in 1914 or whatever. Anyhow, the, the, the came, they came to me and said, would I build a Beachy? I said, sure. I think they paid seven or $800, and they gave it back to me afterwards. So that's fine. They showed it. And that was over in San Francisco, wherever they had this second show of it. And it ended up out in the bay. <laughs> I always put the pilot's feet uh, hanging, part man, part, part machine. Now that's a typical airplane installation. Uh, I, have, I have a little Mustang, and I've had the whole airplane in a Mustang. <laughs> now what I did learn was you can't have that much angle because the waves catch that tail and it's gone in a minute. So I have to break, put something to get them up more of a level situation. This would be plane 24. It's backwards there, but it's, I number the planes. And, the, uh, and that's the one that was in front of Scoma. So you can see he put some lights and put a deck out there where you could go to it. I, I made this, this guy, and I went to the billboard people. And I, there was a billboard right there by Scoma's. And I said, I have this. I'd like to hang it off your billboard. I said, oh, people would look at my billboard. Well, I thought that's what you wanted. <laughs> no, no, we don't want anybody to look at it. So I went to the Emeryville market, and I talked to them, and they said, sure. Um, I made a metal thing. You can see it up there at the top that stuck out from the, the roof. Let him hang down. And so he was there about a week, and it snowed in Berkeley. Now, how many times have it snowed in Berkeley? But the snow made it very heavy, so it broke, and it only lasted <laughs> one week. The only time it ever snowed, I think, in Berkeley. That's a typical shot of whatever. Now, this is in Scomas. He did buy an Italian airplane, and I don't remember, he paid seven or eight hundred dollars for it. And he, instead of giving me money, he gave me a tab. And for a 25-year-old kid and his wife to come into Scomas and have a big dinner and just sign a tab was really fun. We, we did that for weeks. So he did, he bought this, and then he bought a Zeppelin. And I came in, and the nose of the Zeppelin was an umbrella. He didn't like that at all. And the gondola was a swim fin, which he thought that was fine. So anyhow, I took it down, took off the nose, and made a more nosy nose, not an umbrella. And then he said, OK, he's got those two. Then he wanted a shark. So I made a big 10-foot long shark. And he came in, and he looked at it, and he said, no, it's too Captain Nemo-y. I can't handle it. So, OK, that was that. Um, the difference between the ships, this is the same 18-foot long or whatever, um, takes a truck or a car to get it down to the bay. But this takes four people, lift it off, put it in the water, we're done. I walk out with a rope or something, tie it off. And so the, the ship is an easier installation. The only thing is, the ship lasts a week, if that. And we've tried uh, the thing when you go to Tahoe with the chains, welding them together, 50 foot of chain, lasts a day. We've gone, I've gone to the people who do uh, for your boat out in the bay, that inch nylon rope that they do. And they have a shock absorber that's rubber and lets it go one week. It's just there's too much action through the Golden Gate Bridge. So they're easier to do, they're fun, but they just don't last very long. Now that's still the Red Baron is there. That's just a stumping. I did this uh, submarine. And what happened was, it was on the tide. 
one day you'd go by and you'd see the periscope, the top. And then the next day you'd go by and you'd see the machine gun and the periscope and the captain. The next day it'd be, so it was a matter of which day you went by is what you saw of the submarine. My front yard was getting a little full, my driveway. <laughs> and so uh, my wife had gone to New York to study one summer. And so I did the, the, the ship. And it's 18 foot long, because that's exactly what my garage is, 18 foot long. And so there's the, <laughs> there, there is the Viking ship. And you can get an idea of the size from that. So again, it's easy to get it down. Uh, we don't know whether it's going to stand up or not, what's going to happen when it hits the water. So they're heading out to the Red Baron, and we'll tie it off to the post there and let it float out in front of the, there. So if I go down the next day, I can find that. Now, a week later, there wouldn't have been anything, not even How a. How long did the boat last? Just a couple of days. I mean, the minute they hit the rocks, that's it. It's gone. But I went down the next day and found this and was able to retrieve that. But that was a, if I'm not there the next day, it's gone. Now, there are a bunch of posts there where he used to have his restaurant. The restaurant, it's interesting, he sold it to his employees, and that went for a few years. And then somebody bought it and sawed it in half, put it on a barge, and took it up the delta. And somewhere up the delta is, is his restaurant. But nobody, I've never been able to find it. I have no idea where it is. But these were the posts that were out in front. And so this was just a real easy installation. One boat, me, and a ladder. And as you can see, how many posts there were. So there were 20 posts running out in front of Joe Scomas, and I had something on all of them at one time. And that was kind of the typical installation. I didn't do all of them one day. I'd do one a month or something. What year is that with this photo about? 85, maybe, something like that. And that would be the typical, I call them post people. My studio is full of post people. And if those posts were still there, I'd still be doing it. But they, they tell me that right here between high and low tide, the bugs eat it and it rots and, and falls over. And the minute it falls over, of the 20 posts, there are maybe two left. Uh, and those are, you can see, they're pretty healthy pieces of stuff. But when they hit the rocks, they turn to, to nothing. Now that would have been where Scomas was, right there. And that's the dock that came out in front of Scomas. That's a typical <laughs> day on the bay. And it didn't matter whether it was high or low tide for those. And that would be typically, well, you can tell I had hair, so it had to be. Who is that guy? <laughs> we know where that was. Those are the same as the airplane. They're hollow inside. It's a frame I wrap with cloth and maybe some plastic. And then I gesso it and then paint it. And that's a typical figure of those. This would be hollow. That's hollow inside. This is in my studio, and there's more of them that would go out there if there were still posts. There are a few, so I still go out occasionally. But she's hollow. Uh, even the feet are hollow, gessoed with, uh, that's probably a sweater uh, on her chest. And then that's a purse upside down on the top. Uh, Again, that would be hollow and uh, gessoed and then painted. And those are the figures that were all kind of meant to go out in the bay, like that. So that was my gallery. And I'm sorry it's gone. <laughs> I wish it was. If it's still there, I'd still be doing it, obviously. Uh, Taylor, are the pieces in the gallery up front, were those all intended to go on a post, perhaps? Oh, yeah. Everything was, I mean, that was where it was headed for. And when I'm down putting those, they fall in the water. I pick up some pieces, make the mask out of whatever I found at the bay. So everything's one way or the other. It's at the bay. So 
So I wish it was still there, but it's not. That's a, a typical piece that went out there. And we were making that book, and my wife saw that, and she said, I want one of those. <laughs> OK, so I did a new one for her as in our front hall, but it's that piece. Uh, did it again, because that one's long gone. I had mentioned art school, my four A's and four F's. This is what I was doing. Well, they were all abstract expressionists. Uh, I was 20, and they were 40. And they didn't think pop was right at all. They were very upset with pop. They hate it. These are life size, six foot tall. Uh, it's a painting, kind of, but it has all kinds of stuff. They didn't like that at all. Buttons and <laughs> buttons and bows. And so this is one of the pieces that uh, when we left Kansas City to come here, we just had a big bonfire. Because my wife said, well, where is that? Well, we, we burned that one up. But they were, ask you, where is the they were life size, and they hated it. One of the problems was I had the, a cutout lady, a, a size, side view of a lady, on a real chair. And so they all liked this chair. They all came in, and it was down in the basement of a pizza parlor, which I had strung lights around and had my exhibit. And one of the professors had too much to drink and sat down and started talking to her. Once, once he knew he'd talked to, he was one of the Fs. He was very upset. But this was what I was doing. And of course, as abstract expressionists, that was, they had nothing to do with that at all. Didn't like it. Didn't understand. Now, when I got to California, uh, I walked into a couple of galleries. And the only thing they said, oh, another Midwestern pop artist. Here comes another one. But, uh, they thought it was just fine. California had moved on farther than Kansas. So that's the original Skoma. They just cut it right down the middle, took it up the delta. There's the billboard that I want to hang the, the uh, soldier off of. And as you see, it started there. You know, there'd be one month and another month and another month coming out. It, it's just all I knew. I didn't really, I liked Jackson Pollock. When I was, went to Greenwich Village, I spent every day in front of Jackson Pollock's work, and I went out to where he had just died and met his friends who gave me a lot of Jackson Pollock stories. But I was doing, you know, this kind of stuff, and the ones you saw, it's just what came out of me was not abstract expression. And I, I know they talk about the plane, the picture plane. You can do anything you want to to the plane, but don't go out, forward, up, and stay on the plane. If it's six foot by six foot, you deal with the plane. And I didn't want to deal with it. I wanted to go up and out and around. And that's why I think you know, I didn't get along with them. But uh, that was fine. When I got to California, it was just fine. There, the Bowles Gallery was very prestigious. I was 27 and the stable of 20 artists, uh, all were 30, 47, let's say, very well established. The great thing about the bowls was once a month, you would get to have your show, once a year, I mean, for a month. And everybody would come to the opening to reinforce everybody else and make them feel good. And it became a real family thing. Once a month, you went and saw the stable at the bowls gallery. If it was still there, I'd still be part of it. But after about three or four years, John Bowles is the architect who did the Candlestick Park, whatever, it's being torn down right now. But he didn't really care for art that much. And he was very much into Egyptian. He had been in Egypt when uh, what's his face discovered the tomb and all that. He, he had those ob some of those objects in his office, which he would take you and show you his Egyptian stuff. And when he died, he was buried up in Marin with his Egyptian stuff. And I know that because Hayward King was there and had to help bury Bowles with his Egyptian stuff. So, but after about three years, he tired of it. And it was really heady stuff for kids because I was not yet 30. And the gallery was upstairs, enormous, maybe 50 by 50. And they would take out a window, six foot by six foot window, and bring in a crane. 
if uh, Sonia Rapoport had a big painting, six by six, out would come in the painted glass, they'd lift it up, put it in the room. So, you know, when you're a kid, that's heavy stuff. Uh, also, that first show I had in San Francisco at John Bowles Gallery, I had the airplane and the sculpture. Well, uh, it's the night of the opening. We walk in, and the guy McChesney, who painted and put bones in his paint, he was 20 years older than me, very famous. He's in one corner. He comes out to the middle of the room. Frederick Hobbs, who's very famous, and did a car, the first art car ever. It was a giant, awful, funny car that he drove to LA and New York in this kind of a monster dragon. Well, he came out of the office where he had been seducing one of the secretaries. Didn't matter which one. And so he came this way, and I came in the door. And the three of us met. And everybody in the gallery just went back against the wall. I, <laughs> there was so much electricity. It was so powerful. I mean, it's happened a couple of times in my life, but that was a major one because these were people I really cared about, and they were helping this, this baby have a show. And so it became, now, if that was still there, I would be in it. But what happened was he closed after about three or four years. Now, here are 20 artists, well known, going around looking for another stable. Well, they had their 20 artists. And so each time you'd go, well, hey, we've got ours. And so it was maybe five years before any of us were in a stable again, like the Bowles Gallery. And that's part of why I started doing this. I didn't really have a stable that I felt the same way about. And I thought, this is, I felt so good about the Soap Shock Derby that this became my gallery, and that's, uh, I would still be with Bowles if that hadn't happened. Somebody said, uh, you're stuck in the World War I. So uh, my daughter was working in a jewelry shop, and she brought me this plastic dome. You can imagine jewelry under that thing. And so I did this same thing. It's hollow, like a frame, gessoed. And then so it has this base and the Martian and it happened to have this figure that was going on. So it seemed right to take it out, and it was the year 2000 probably, and start something new. Again, I had to make something to make it stay up out of the water when the tide came. But that was five, six years ago. That was probably the, what I've done since then. But that's uh, why it's not a slider, because slides are dead. <laughs> People don't do slides, but do other things. thought they could spend the money a lot better ways than that. Now it's a bird sanctuary, and you can't go out there. Um, I guess there's a little deck or something. You can go take a picture of the birds or something. But the whole idea was clean it up. Um, and this was about 15 years ago that they paid a million dollars to do that. Yeah, because I remember um, my family lived here in the 70s, and I would really not come up and move right by, and I'd see pianos and things. <laughs> Dragons. Someone made a grand piano. 
<laughs> that was wonderful. A band. There was a total band. There was a drummer and then a guitarist and a whatever and wonderful stuff. And all over the world, you know, United Press International would pick it up, go all over the world. But uh, uh, at the time, there was a big interview with the examiner with me and the bird guy. And so I got his name and I called him and I said, I think you and I should be on the same side. I think they want to build a motel or a hotel or whatever. Well, they want to do something that we shouldn't be for it. But he thought the birds were going to be safer from an artist once in a month going down and hammering yeah. <laughs> something. Yeah. I don't think it was a problem at all. But, yeah. uh, and the other funny thing was when they replanted it, when they got rid of all the sculpture, they didn't think about high tide. And they used it with plantings that wouldn't handle the salt water. So the next day, it was all dead from the salt water. <laughs> but anyhow, that's government money, whatever. Now, to finish that story, there is a group now in Emeryville who wants to do a mud flat something. So they called me and had me come to one of their meetings. And they want to do, and we've seen it all over the Bay Area, we want to pick a corner, get permission, put a big sculpture there. We're going to pay 20 grand for it. You do it, and then the neighbors don't like it, and it's gone in a week. Mm -hmm. It's happened in Concord. Remember those big yeah. spikes that went up? and yeah, They lasted a week. They were gone. The thing in New York, you walked out of a building, and there was a great big curve. Gone. So I'm not sure that they are going to be able to do that. But they keep saying, well, we want a new mud flats. Mm -hmm. Well, you had it, and now it's gone. And nobody's going to let you do two things. Nobody's going to let you do a mud flat along the freeway, the Caltrans. And there's no place where that junk comes from China once a day. Because they're saying, well, people will go out and make sculpture. Not if there's nothing to make sculpture out of. So yeah, that's, I've said my idea is I have hundreds of photographs of the bay. There was a, a nice old Jax, Mr. Jackson black man who came out all the time and took pictures of all that. The city of Emeryville blew them up to 40 by 60. Now they don't know where they are. But those photographs would be wonderful. I'll blow up my stuff and have an exhibit of mm -hmm. photography. I think that's about as good as going to happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, that, that's not what they want to do. They really want to do a, you know, under the freeway, the minute you get off, there's sculptures underneath it, the metal pieces. Mm -hmm. They love that. Well, there's nobody to object. There's no neighbors to say, I don't like that. Well, unless they find a place like that, it's not going to happen. But. Yeah, were there any other artists um, that used the mudflats actively over the years as their medium and as their gallery like you did? There was one guy that I knew. He moved to New York. I don't remember his name. But he did a tower, the tallest one ever done. Mm -hmm. It had no sculptural look, but it looked like a tower. Mm -hmm. He did that. Um, didn't last very long, uh, but I, I don't have never had a, the name of a person yeah. who was doing that because it was families, it was factory people, it was it was just everyday people loved doing it, and so I don't know anybody that ever did it. And I never had any problems because I was up the way, mm -hmm. and so when the city paid a million dollars, they didn't even talk to me. They just. <laughs> I just, the next day I went out and put on another airplane. <laughs> it doesn't matter. To, and I've had, well, to kind of finish this story, I, everybody always says, did you ask permission? No, we had uh, fake stuff. We, uh, uh, all kinds of beautifully done stuff from the University of California, from the city of Berkeley, all this fake stuff. They, no, nobody ever cared. And so we went for a long time. And then I was doing one near Skomas there, and a policeman came storming down, you know, young, new policeman. What are you doing? And so I took him to the side, and I said, you know, that's the Chronicle, that's the Examiner, that's Channel 7. Are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> he kind of thought about it, and he went away quickly. The other time, I needed a boat, and somebody said, go to the marina there in Emeryville and talk to the harbor master. He'll get you a boat. So I did. He said, oh, absolutely. We love it. You can have a boat, but get permission. Oh, boy. I've been doing it for 20 years. I didn't 
And he said, look at that building up on the top floor. Go there, get permission. So I had stuff in my car. and I went up to the 20th floor. A n- nice young kid in a suit and tie. He looked at it. He said, well, I'll be right back. 20 minutes later, he's back. He said, well, if you come back next week, we may be able to tell you what color they should be. <laughs> I said, well, what? are you saying I can do it? No, no, we're just going to tell you what color we are. So I went back and got my car and went to my studio and I called the BCDC. That's the Bay Area Conservation whatever. Because the highway is Caltrans, the little road is the railroad, and the water is BCDC. So I called him, I said, could I speak to the president of the BCDC in some tower over in the city? And he came on, I said, I'm the guy that does the mud front. Said, oh, I love that stuff, he said. Okay, so sure, I'll call the marina right now, and tomorrow we were out putting up a new one. We never talked to the city of Emerville. Or, yeah, that was the only time I ever tried to get permission. I should have known better. Yeah. But, uh. It's interesting. It's where the obviously the land meets the sea, so there's a lot of turbulence there, but politically and with bureaucracy. You can imagine. There's a lot of you know, claim. The, the bay, the port, you know, the cities themselves, it's all colliding. So it's kind of cool that you subversively <laughs> went out there and just put your heart out there. Because well, trying yeah. to get permission would be nearly impossible. No, I, no, nobody could. Yeah. Uh, I've never seen anything down there at all as a, as a location to put your sculpture. There are, one of the first ladies here was talking about there is a little peninsula right there that between Berkeley and Emeryville, mm-hmm. that would be a great place for a big piece of sculpture. Now, one time, uh, after they spent the million dollars, they said, well, what are we going to do to make up for that? And they did a contest, mm-hmm. and a young lady built a proposal and she, she called me and she said, oh, I love what you do and I'm really impressed by it. And she had a big hand, maybe six foot by eight foot hand and put it up on the top of a tall thing like this. And they paid her 30 grand or whatever. Well, it was right by the fire department there at Emeryville and nobody could see it. And now, I went to see it the other day, it's clear out at the end of Emeryville where those restaurants are way out in the water in front of one of those. So that was kind of their effort to do a legitimate... And I can't say I've seen it because of its location. No, it's, that, yeah. um, uh, it's a Chinese restaurant, clear out on the end, yeah. it's right in front of that. So <laughs> nobody sees it unless you're going <laughs> to the restaurant. So. Anyone have any questions? Maybe if you could speak to um, the Emeryville Museum and the part about that you are I'm really particularly thinking of the Viking ship, but really all of your pieces of working so hard on them in your studio, taking them out, knowing that they might only last once they're on site a day, a week. How, how is he's that he's for cool you? Off. He's cool off. And how does that, how is it in your creative process to know that the final piece will be so ephemeral? It may have been after getting out of art school leaving Kansas City, coming to Berkeley, we burned everything. We just took it out in the back, and you can do that in the Midwest, and had a big barrel and just burned everything. Because we couldn't take it to California. We couldn't leave it there. The landlord wouldn't have liked that. Uh, So it wasn't a problem at all to get rid of all that. So when I got here, having Mother Nature take care of something in a week, um, no problem at all. I'm fine with that. No, you wouldn't say that if you saw my studio. <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, packed with, uh. yeah. So I would say the figures that are out there, what, maybe 50 of them in my yeah, studio? This is a 50. Very small the mask, of them. maybe yeah. 100 of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, it's, it's all, and it, it, would, uh, it would go in the bay if the post was still there. And he sold a lot, which makes me very happy because I'm not precious about any of it. Um, you know, these things were fun to make, but I don't care at all what happens to uh, the pieces. I just have never been precious about anything I've ever done. That's uh, hey, if people can see it and have fun and see it out there, that's that's great. Uh, that's kind of why the ships are more fun because. 
you know, the airplanes everybody's used to. For 20 years they've been, as they tell me, from the back seat of the Volkswagen bus, they saw that airplane when they were six years old or whatever. But the ships, not everybody gets to see those, so they're really fun to, to do. And in those days, when I did those ships, you could drive right there on the water. Now it's a bicycle path, a running path, a road, a fence. But in those days, it was you were right there. So if a family took that way, yeah. do you recall doing a shoe shop stall? A what? A shoe shop stall. I remember a piece of artwork in the mud flats. It was shoes in a stall. No, that wasn't me. That wasn't you. That wasn't mine. I was about thirty-five years old. Ah. Uh -huh. My daughter. Uh -huh. Selling shoes. There was, was there was something north of me past the racetrack, they took all those tires that people throw on the thing, and they stood them up, so it made loops, loops, and then they did the head of the dragon. So that was a real nice piece, the only one I've ever seen there in the north end of past the racetrack. Yeah, I have a photograph of that. Too, in the bowl? Hmm? Near the bowl? The yes, right there. The water in front of that. Uh, I know those people. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen to that. Uh, you know, again, like in Emeryville, the people are going to pay a million dollars to get them out of there and make it a park or whatever. I went down to see them one day, and we were doing something in Albany at the high school, and I got them to bring down a big panel, oh, bigger than this whole wall, and put it in that veterans building. Uh, but they didn't like the people that came, and the people that came didn't like them, and it wasn't a happy marriage that I hoped for. But uh, I know that there's some really nice stuff down there, but it's also a little dangerous. It's not that safe to go around the bulb and walk your dog or whatever. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens to us. I think what'll happen to us is what's where they fly kites. Mm -hmm. now, it became a big garbage dump that they smooth over. Mm -hmm. The flames come up once in a while, the gas. <laughs> and you're out for, I think it's gonna be one, another one of those parks, but who knows what's... Uh, it was a big homeless encampment for a while. Mm -hmm. It was a homeless encampment. Oh, very much so. Oh, yes, yes. A scary one, actually. I have a new airplane, uh, which we may show here uh, next year sometime. It's uh, 10 by 12 by what? We, I tried to put it in that room and it wouldn't. Yeah, it didn't quite fit. Well, <laughs> it was too big. <laughs> we're talking but perhaps next year in the. In perhaps the, next year over the there, uh, a new plane. And then after it shows there, because I really like people to see it up close, because everybody thinks these are models, you know, like a model airplane. Hey, they're 18 foot by whatever. But anyhow, if we show it here, then after it'll probably go where they're in Emmyville, they stole the propeller and the the pilot off that one, the two planes were facing each other. And I got, they, I don't know, it must be easy to steal the propeller and steal the pilot. And so yesterday, just to, I made four new propellers. <laughs> I, just, I, I want to I be ready. Yeah, because the kids go out, and from that dock, they can actually spin the propeller. Also, the fishermen tell me that they spin it for luck, so they catch a fish. So, you know, it's, Something important to have this it's propeller, lore now at this <laughs> <laughs> have it turn around, yeah. and uh, but that's what they always steal is that. So, because I don't, they're not man enough to steal a whole airplane. Yeah. That, Get a boat. Come on. <laughs> that's why I think the, it's a fraternity of ten kids who yeah, did yeah. it. And someday I keep thinking someday somebody will. Oh yeah, I saw your airplane up on the campus in the basement. But mm. sign me up next time you're. One out in the bay. It sounds like a blast. Yeah. It's, uh, I had a young person come from Colorado from an art school that I knew somebody lived with us for a couple of weeks. And we found him a show at the Richmond Art Center. And we had him to dinner with the curator. They hated each other. They had a big fight. But he still showed him. <laughs> I don't know what that's all about. But anyhow, we were going to do an airplane. So he came along. And as we were transferring the plane onto the boat, he put his foot through the, what you saw as a cloth, mm -hmm. went right through it. 
I thought they were going to drown him, kill him. I said, no, no, it's nothing. It's just a piece of sculpture. You know, he's a living person. <laughs> but he was in danger of his life because he put his foot through the, the side of the airplane. But probably on the side that didn't show. That's probably why I didn't care. Very prolific. Is your work going to be at the Richmond Art Center and the big anniversary show? Not that I know of. I, I would talk to Jan L. Worm there because mm -hmm. she's putting this together now, the opening in September. There, artists who showed their work in Richmond 50 yeah. years ago and uh, all the pioneering people that we know about yeah. today. There, perfect for that. There is a, how can I say it? Uh, the Berkeley Art Museum mm -hmm. has never shown me. You know, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art has my work and has shown it. The Oakland Museum has my work and has shown it. The Berkeley one, never, ever, no conversation. With it. And now they're in a new spot, and I went to the opening, and there wasn't much art in it. And I asked about it, and they said, well, we want people to look at the architecture. We'll do art later. Uh, but I'm saying that um, a little of what I do, he tends to say, I'm a little rebellious or something. I don't think I am, but I think that kind of sticks. I think the Berkeley Art Museum has not shown me because I'm not right somehow. I'm not. I've run into that in other places. That well, we'll just have to fix that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I know another person who makes a few airplanes once in a while and they hang from the ceiling. Gail Wagner. Oh, yes. Two guys get together. It's spectacular. Because you make it for love. Yes. So. People say I should know him. I've seen pictures of his airplanes. Um, He's over south of Jack London. He was also a large metal, large scale metal sculpture as well. And I'm really tied to the East Bay. Since the Bowls, I don't know that I've ever gone back to the city at all. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think if I had, there was an ADI gallery near the old museum. I showed there for a couple of years. Um, but uh, my ties to the city just kind of, you know, it's more East Bay. And so that's who I approach. Uh, like you say, Richmond Art Center, I, appro I would approach somebody like that. Go talk to Jan, because I bet she'd be interested in the specials with it for some Besides Tyler, is obviously his work in the bay and his sculptures that he makes. These are all from found materials that you find in the bay. He also yeah. has, would you like to talk briefly about your oh. journaling process? Um, it's, it's incredible. Work. I have that, oh, I lost my thing. I had that show uh, in San Francisco at the Bowls upstairs. They later moved downstairs on Gold Street. And it was time of the Texas oil boom. Texan walked in and said, I want the whole show shipped to Houston. Mm -hmm. Okay, hey, airplane, everything. Mm -hmm. So we got the price. It was the price of a new Cadillac convertible, and it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, this is never going to happen. Um, and I had been using Xerox, black and white Xerox, for an announcement. Like for this show, I would do a little something, Xerox it, and send it to 10 people, and they'd come to the opening. Well, Xerox came out with a color copier. And this was 1970, and they didn't know what to do with it. And so I walked in somewhere and made a couple of copies. They said, well, we'll pay you and let you use the machine for free and give classes. They thought, well, maybe artists will use it, maybe industry, who knows? And so I started doing the color copy of my collage. And so now I'm doing them, what am I gonna do with them? And I, the pile was getting this deep because I do 10 collages a week, I mean a day. I do a sculpture a month and 10 collages a day. So I found that a book like this, I can do 100 collages and just put it on the shelf and it takes care of it. Uh, so I'm up to book number 400 and something. So uh, 415 times 220 pages, whatever that is. That's how many collages there are. But it's not too bad because they're in a bookcase uh, in my house, I use eight and a half, eleven always. That's just a, I've oh I've made some forty-eight by forty. Uh, typically, um, well I always like paint, in the, so I always use I like a book when you open it up and there's paint in it. Uh, 
typically, those would be a collage that I do 10 of a week. Um, and I, I have sold them, but never, I mean, it's been so much the sculpture. Right now, it's the sculpture. And if it's the moment for these things, now I can tell you right now, in 40 years, I might have sold two pieces in 40 years. Now, in this last year, you and Nyad, uh, we've sold 25. So suddenly, these are the things that, that are working. I think people say, oh, he did the airplane, I can have that. <laughs> or if it's a cocktail, I mean, a coffee table piece. Uh, so right now is that moment. If somebody wants to have a show of the collages, uh, color Xerox and whatever, uh, and I have, I, did, I had somebody at lunch the other day at my studio who, he invited me to, to the Art Institute back at that time. And the reason I had him to lunch, I was so pleased that he had done that and had me talk to his students about color Xerox. And to give you an example, he had me come, had me do it, the kids loved it, uh, the color Xerox people gave him a copier for the school. Okay, now, in the next month, a dear friend, uh, was at Cal State Hayward, head of the department. He had me out to do the same thing. Mish Cohn, the famous printmaker, was there. He almost had a heart attack. Color Xerox, <laughs> how in the hell can you do that? You've got to be on a printing machine. You've got to be... Right. Yeah, you got to be on a printing press. You can Oh, he just turned red. They almost had to carry him out. So I was so pleased with this guy at the Art Institute, a photographer, who had me talk to his kids. I didn't mean that this was the end of the world. This method of it was just another thing that you could have. You have a camera. You have a copy machine. You have a printing press. But he was very upset. So anyhow, whatever show I'm having at that moment goes in the book. Kind of history stuff goes in the a book. Journal as well. A journal, and it's a day. So it's always fun when the day comes and it has something to do with here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's kind of a nice, uh, this is the soapbox derby stuff mm -hmm. that may go to LA, which will be fun if it does. Uh, this is this movie, uh, go on the internet and go to Junkopia. Just Junkopia. His name is uh, Chris Marker. He was 91, he just died. He did The 13 Monkeys with Brad Pitt and Bruce Willis. It's a wonderful little movie, and it's about 10 minutes long, and it, the very first thing is my ship in a plane, and then they do all that stuff up by the, the dragons and all that, and then they end up with one of my planes, and it's just a beautiful, nice music. Uh, he had been coming out for 20 years taking shots. No, no, we didn't know, nobody ever heard that he was taking these shots all along. And then ended up, before he died, made a movie out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, this was when, the, that's what most people know, is the original Red Baron and the Snoopy, and it's a friend of mine who makes stamps. Uh, they're not real, but you can get the government, they'll make them real stamps, but these aren't. He made a stamp out of this, and <laughs> my wife is with Kaiser, and her computer is very precious. I mean, don't even sneeze on it or anything. It's all tied in for her work. And so when she starts going on this stuff and there's all this contamination, she, so I went to the next door to the teenage kid. I knew he'd know what to do. Went on the computer and Googled me and found this stuff. He found a photographer who was going to the, the uh, what, what would you call where they keep all their stuff, an examiner, mm -hmm. making a copy of it, taking it on framing it and selling it on the internet for 30 bucks. I don't care, I mean, he may be the photographer that did them originally. But anyhow, the kid found a stamp, Tyler James Orr, Berkeley, California, 13 euros. We don't know what country it is, where it is. I'd love to know, but yeah. we haven't found <laughs> it yet. Okay, so that's a stamp somewhere in the world. You're being uh, there, these are the two that are right now in Emeryville. You can walk out on that deck and spin this propeller, spin this propeller. Uh, New Year's Eve, they had some fireworks that burnt some of the do dock where you walk out on. I'm waiting for them to repair that because I don't want some kid going out and spinning the propeller and falling in the bay. I don't want to fall in the bay. So, but that's what you would see are those two. 
and that was the plane. I'm very much into cars, so the car stuff goes in. This was this was just in a, a weekly about talking about today um, and the show here. Uh, I this is the color Xerox. I did it on plastic. Uh, I did it on a wood, plastic, different different things. Um, and that would be the original plane and later out there. They, that's kind of what happens to them in no time at all. A wing will fall off, the head gets shot up, uh, and then I would go out and repair it and repaint it, put it back. But this is, uh, George Barris was a car friend and he just died and so this is about him. Because my wife doesn't care about cars at all, but she saw this at a show and she said, oh, that's kind of special. That's a, and I, so that's George Barris who just passed away. You were a friend of George Barris? Oh yeah, we've been friends for years. Um, I would go to the car shows with my car, the ones out in front there, and meet these people and I would have a book like this. So this was George Barris would sign this when I saw him. So it goes on all these famous car people for about 10 years. They didn't know they were rock stars. <laughs> Suddenly now they go to a car show and they sit there at a table and they sign these photographs and sell them for 20 or 30 bucks. But they didn't know that then. So they would come and sign my books or I would send them the loose pages and they'd return. In each case, George Barris, Ed Big Daddy Roth, Tommy the Greek, after about 10 years I would get a letter from a secretary. Our lawyers will no longer let him sign anything. Oh. Come on. <laughs> so my answer to that is, I remember there was a big show in San Francisco, the old museum, and Henry Hopkins liked artists. He really loved artists. And he had a, a list of 100 artists, and he would invite them to different things. And one of the things he invited us to was the Soapbox Derby. We did a cookbook. We did uh, Artist Appreciation Night. He'd have a big piece of stack of paper. As the artist walked in, you'd draw on it, the next month you'd come back and it was framed on the wall selling to make money for the museum. So anyhow, the, the moment came when you could no longer get anything from these people because of the lawyers. Mm -hmm. Well, we were at one of these things at the San Francisco Museum, the hundred people on the list, and everybody was signing this poster because one of the artists had AIDS. Mm -hmm. And they were going to raise money by signing this poster. And it came around to one of the artists, I don't remember who, and he said, my lawyer won't let any, me sign anything. 199 voices said, get a new lawyer. <laughs> Come on. That was, uh, uh, I really liked Pollock. I spent um, a summer when I was 19 in living in Greenwich Village, and I would go see Autumn Rhythm uh, every day, uh, but I, and you could do that for free. But I knew that like the Guggenheim and the other, it was five bucks, I couldn't afford that. But I wanted to be an artist. But I knew I had no business being an artist in New York City at 20 years old. As, you, know, you never saw the, the uh, cowboy movie. <laughs> no, 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 I knew better than that. So I wanted to get a degree. I, I had an offer from this, he was a neighbor of Jackson Pollock who gave me a lot of Pollock stories. And he said, I'll get you in Cooper Union. And it was just about time to start school. And I said, I've got no business being in Cooper Union in New York City at 19 or whatever. Uh, I'll go back and get a degree in Kent, which was the right thing to do, obviously. Uh, but I, I couldn't have lasted a month in New York, I don't think. But uh, the, the stories, one of the quick in, in stories, um, Jackson Pollock was with his girlfriend and he had a wreck in his convertible. His wife was back in Europe. And so he died and she raced home and all the neighbors met, and this is from the neighbor, this is where I got this, they all went looking around for Jackson Pollock stuff. And they found a grocery store where he traded his work for food. They found a floor in a kitchen that he had dripped on a linoleum. So they picked up all the panels, <laughs> put it in, <laughs> framed it, and anybody could sign Jackson Pollock because it was done with a big brush. So the wife and all the neighbors were signing, getting ready for what was coming because they knew he didn't get any of it while he was alive. But the minute you die, you know, that's the best thing an artist can do. 
well, er everything was going to be great, and it was. Now, I will say that what she has done with it, you know, she does uh, scholarships for artists all over the world, and she's been very good with the money. But uh, uh, that was uh, the night they <laughs> saved Jackson Pollock because yeah. he was gone. Well, thank you, Pat. It's been wonderful. I think we'll have to have more talks with you, maybe. <laughs> um, would you like to show us your, your rod out front, too? Oh, sure. Yeah. sure. Custom. My car. Do you have any thoughts or questions before we wrap it up? Uh, just one last one. I uh, saw, I, I, I peeked at your, your collage log, mm -hmm. Brad, um, and I saw there's a Ed Russia. Boucher. Um, Boucher. Mm -hmm. Boucher or, yeah. Well, I had a professor pronounce it Russia. Boucher. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, are you, was that him standing in front of the painting? Or is it his painting? I don't know. Was that a collage? I don't know. Uh, the gas station? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, he and. Um, Um, he's uh, yeah, a dear friend oh, of a car guy. Back up. Was it far? Yeah. Anyhow, th they've been friends from the beginning of time. And it, it's interesting, he wasn't. He was fast Back up. He was not given any credit. Right oh, yeah, yeah. No, but I'm looking for his partner. Oh, <laughs> he has a partner in crime. Because he's always been at the top of the art world, and is right now he's having his moment for sure. Uh, but this other artist is a car artist, so he's considered, and they even call it lowbrow. But he's having his moment now. The pin striker? Williams, Robert Williams. Oh, Robert Williams, who does outsider art, they called it. Well, suddenly now, He's doing big sculptures, big paints. He's in New York. It's, it's happened for him. Yeah. But they, they are buddies from teenage time. And so I know Williams better because of the car thing. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, he'll he sign anything I send him because the lawyers haven't got to it yet. <laughs> and, and she got mad because her name is Suzanne, and I spelled it wrong. <laughs> so she sent a big note. It's not spelled that way. But anyhow, no, the car people, now, they have nothing to do with art at all, but I consider their cars to be works of art. And they pinstripe and they do all this stuff to a car. I started in high school. Uh, in Joplin, Missouri, you couldn't be an artist. I mean, that was just, I don't know what they would have done to you, but it wouldn't have been nice. And so I didn't try, but I had a car. And so I immediately, uh, much like the airplanes, uh, I was a person with legs and four wheels. And so I was able to customize, like the one out in front, a car, and that was okay. Yeah. And so right off, uh, I knew the car people, and I would go to their events. And uh, in Wichita, there was a guy named Starbird who did all the bubble tops. Mm -hmm. He would go to the Air Force <laughs> and get a bubble okay. top and do his car. So anyway, I knew all those people. So when I got to California, I said, uh, I'm going to do the same thing. And my wife said, OK. She's, we went to a drive-in in San Leandro in 1980. This is when it had all been big from 50 to, say, 60, the custom car thing. Then it went away. It was gone for 20 years. I mean, there was none of it. And the Oakland Roadster Show and all that kind of thing. So we went to this drive-in, and here were all these custom cars. And my wife said, you really want to do that again? I said, yeah, I do. So I did the car that's out in front. And there were no custom cars around. So we were cruising somewhere in Oakland, and the low riders come up, totally different group of people. And they're bouncing. And my wife says, I guess I'll do this and make a car. So I was going to join the, the low riders. But that very month, somebody had a thing out in San Leandro at a, a drive in, and with the roller skating car hops and the, the food from the 50s and the 60s. We went, and as we were walking around, she said, OK, go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I did this car out here and been very active with those people. We meet about 1,000 from here and 1,000 from LA meet in Santa Maria or Paso Robles. And they let us have the whole town. Everybody goes. <laughs> and everybody's in the 50s and the 60s. And then you go back on the freeway to go home, and you're back out in 
yeah. Honda hell. <laughs> but, uh, so I, I've always been, I don't know if it's said in my book, I've always been into custom cars, modern art, and naked women. <laughs> and not in that order. Uh, and uh, it's just been what I've devoted my books to. And There's, um, you guys are welcome to browse through the books he brought up front as well. And of course the gallery, enjoy it. Yeah. There's a little sampling of some of his work that we pulled from his studio. And maybe are you part of the Quirky Berkeley website? No. Oh, you should go I don't even know how to turn the computer on. No, but Quirky yeah. Berkeley is a wonderful site. Oh, it's just fabulous. Uh, somebody told me there's a term for me. Somebody who doesn't even know how to turn the computer on, uh, has a dial phone, typewriter. Maestro, yeah. King of the Cowboy Artists, brought his yeah. grandson around. He loved my manual typewriter. He was oh, on yeah. it for an hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, and I can't do it because my wife is with Kaiser. She's getting business on the computer. And if it, if he gets some dirty stuff, it just. <laughs> and, and they pay big for protection, whatever. Yeah. Does, doesn't do it. Doesn't do it. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Oh, yeah. My pleasure. Yeah, you guys take